It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Kiewitnaw. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier. We understand clearly Ontar that Ontario is working to push mining process, mining access roads to the Ring of Fire area, and has done much of this work while First Nations have been struggling through the pandemic and weren't even able to host meetings to understand how to participate. My question, uh, uh, Speaker, is, is Ontario prepared to agree that all proposed mines in the Ring of Fire region will be designated to need provincial comprehensive EAs and actually involve the nations who will be impacted? Response to the government, the Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member for his question and welcome his guests to this place today. Mr. Speaker, that's precisely what we're doing. We take our responsibilities through Section 35 of the Charter very seriously. They are affirmed, Mr. Speaker, and they necessarily uh, involve consultation and engagement with Indigenous communities across. Uh, all of Ontario, in fact, Mr. Speaker, and that's why, for example, with the Far North Act, we heard the communities loud and uh, clear through one of the most extensive consultations in the Far North Act, Mr. Speaker, that was modernized with my colleague at the time, Minister Yakubuski, uh, uh, as he was, and uh, reflected a consensus-based model, Mr. Speaker, on all aspects and any aspects of development in the Treaty 9. Uh, area uh, consumed or subsumed by uh, the Anishinaabe Ash Response. Ash Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to act in that fashion. Thank you. The supplementary question. This minister, same minister said in my, one of my, uh, when he answered my, one of my questions that duty to consult First Nations in Ontario is not law. Sp speaker, uh, despite the pro-mining posturing, this government hasn't actually set up any real progress in the Ring of Fire. First Nations and mining companies know that nothing is happening there until real partnership, partnerships occur. Will Ontario recognize that it has abused the treaty promises and continued efforts by the Premier to bulldoze the North will lead to conflict? install any real partnerships. Mr. Northern Development and Engineer. Mr. Speaker, real partnerships are defined, and some of the leaders are here today, if not all, on various projects across the region, not just of Treaty 9, but tre uh, Treaty 5, the part that's in Ontario. These are major legacy infrastructure uh, projects, Mr. Speaker, and they reflect a new opportunity, an opportunity for the government to work closely with Indigenous leaders through their economic development corporations, through their political leadership, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that they have the kind of infrastructure they need, the tools that their young people need and want, Mr. Speaker, things like road access, other forms of energy. There are leaders here who represent communities that are still deriving their electricity from diesel. I can't help but think that the Honourable Member stands against that, Mr. Speaker. The Wate Power Connection and other legacy pieces of infrastructure, including companies owned and operated by Indigenous people, Mr. Speaker, Response. stand ready to supply good, clean energy to those Northern communities, roads to improve their health, social and economic access to programming, Mr. Speaker. And that's what this government does best, and that's what we'll continue to work on. Final supplementary. Speaker, uh, uh, this government abandoned dialogue on shared decision-making that was underway years ago and um, is at the heart of the treaty promise to work together and share the land. And right now, Speaker, that is not happening. Will Ontario commit to negotiating in, in good faith that uh, First Nations in Canada to develop a new decision-making regime for the North that can actually encourage some development by ensuring First Nations have real authority to say yes 
or no to major developments in their homelands. Minister. Good news is, Mr. Speaker, that that's actually what's happening on the ground. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the leaders that are here today and some of the projects that we've been working on, some of the major milestones in children, uh, child uh, welfare. I see uh, my longstanding friend and, and the leader of Kitchener Kuza Benenawag here today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, these, these reflect the willingness of this government, the desire uh, to work together on legacy pieces of, of, of infrastructure, economic development opportunities, Mr. Speaker, and social and health uh, programming that improve the fortunes of these communities. Now, with respect to any development, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Environment, for example, the Minister of Mines, we've all gathered together, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that the government's priorities are to support the priorities of the Indigenous communities in and around major resource projects, Mr. Speaker, that the legacy requirements to support them are really about the enhancements to those communities. New forms Response. of energy, no to diesel, Mr. Speaker, yes to clean energy supply, yes to better access to health and social programs in some of our isolated communities, Mr. Speaker, who still don't have access to those kinds of things. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Eglinton LRT has been under construction for 12 years. It has also spiraled beyond its estimated cost from the original $5 billion to nearly $13 billion, and it's uh, you know, likely to rise as well. While the consultants building this project keep racking up the bill, we get faulty LRT platforms, in fact, stations that are broken up and taken away in dump trucks. Speaker, taxpayers whose hard-earned dollars are funding this project, long-suffering residents, businesses that actually went bankrupt and had to close down are all looking for answers. They want transparency. So my question to the Premier is, how much more money, how much more of people's hard-earned dollars will your government waste? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, this government shares the frustrations of those residents and businesses that have been affected by this project, which was, of course, started by the Liberals, uh, and we're going to do it better. We're going to make sure we finish the job and learn from their mistakes. In fact, Speaker, that's the very first thing we did in 2018 by introducing the Builder Building Transit Faster Act, which said, let's simplify the process. You know, I'll give you one example, Speaker. The reason there's years of delay into this process is that every time you wanted to break ground on a station, you needed to get a different permit for every station down the line. We streamlined that so one permit would actually clear the process and get it done faster. That's how the Eglinton West extension is more than 50 percent dug a month ahead of schedule on the record transit expansion this government is introducing. <laughs> Speaker, we wish we could turn back time and fix the Liberals' mistakes from the beginning, but we can't do that. What we can do is learn from them and make sure we do it better moving forward. That's exactly what we're going to do. Record transit is coming to the great people of Toronto and this province. We're back to the minister. After over a decade of construction with numerous delays and billions of dollars over budget, this government said that the Crosstown was finally going to open in 2023, this year. Now, when the project is supposed to be near completion, it is troubling to see newly built, never used stations being ripped out with absolutely no information. Minister, people across Toronto are wondering, what is going on with the Eglinton Crosstown LRT project? Will it ever open? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker. The member asks for information. We're happy to provide that. This government is not only building record transit, we want to make sure that we open it safely. We all see what happens when you rush transit projects to open. Like in the case of the Ottawa LRT, I'm sure the member from Orleans would have a lot to say about that and how not to actually open transit. Speaker, that's why we're taking our time. The Sloan platform was made out of a section of concrete that was identified through a strict and rigorous process that it was not up to the standards that was ready to introduce transit for people to make it safe to ride. Speaker, this government is going to not only build that record transit, 
We're going to make sure we do it right so that it's safe and that it's enjoyed for generations to come. We know hundreds of thousands of people are moving here every year. We're increasing the subway grid by 50 percent, investing more dollars than any government has ever done, Speaker. That includes the opposition who supported the Liberals while for decades they simply did nothing to build transit, connect the grid. We're getting it done for commuters Response. in Ontario. And the final supplementary, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. You know, we've talked to the neighbours around the slow station of the Eglinton LRT. Do you know what they tell us, Speaker? There's a smell coming from that station, and it's not construction dust. The smell is corruption. So what about some specific questions? Yeah, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Drop. What about some specific questions? What about Brian Guest, the disgraced consultant Order. who helped build the Ottawa LRT? that this government fired in January and that the Minister of Transportation promised this House there would be an investigation into Mr. Guest? Well, I've FOI'd it, Speaker. There has been no investigation what? into Brian Guest. The costs keep getting racked up, so the question we need to have answered in this House is how many more consultants like Mr. Guest are going to get rich while cross-town costs go through the roof? How many more deficient projects are they going to build? And more importantly, Speaker, will this government today, as it did when we demanded it from Ottawa, declare a public inquiry into this mess? Simple answer to the question, Happily. yes or no. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Wow, Speaker, the irony from the fiscally conservative New Democrats of Ontario this morning, standing up when the cameras are on and pretending to be the defenders of transit when for decades they supported the Liberals when they did absolutely nothing to expand the grid or improve rider experience. Speaker, in fact, when the cameras were off, not only did they say that they supported transit when they were on, they actually voted against the Building Transit Fast Rest. They said no to the Edmonton West extension. They said no to the Young Order. North extension. They said no to the fine people of Scarborough and the Shepherd East extension. And Speaker, they said no to the Ontario line. They said no to transit that runs through their own riding, Speaker. And now they say no to modernizing transit, to expanding the grid, Speaker. They say no to more fare options. Speaker, this is a party of no when it comes to transit. This government is getting it done for commuters in Ontario. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. Thank you. Start the clock. The next question, the member from Mishkegawak, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. Treaty 9 First Nation and their law firm are here to announce their legal case to end unilateral Crown decision. For years, they have been ignored, denied their decisional making rights, and, they have, and they've had enough. It is imperative that this government to respect Treaty 9 and start working with and alongside First Nation to ensure growth and prosperity like the rest of the province. To the Premier, will this government ensure pre-informed consent for equal opportunity and collaboration at the decision-making level going forward with all First Nations? Mr. Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I won't, I won't talk to matters that uh, are before the courts, but I will discuss uh, Ken Ogamasis Economic Development Corporation, the Waboon Tribal Council, Five Nations Energy, uh, Takwa Tagamu Nation Economic Development. These are just a few of the examples of communities that work in the uh, uh, Treaty 9 area. They're economic development companies 
uh, owned and operated in whole or in part by Indigenous business leaders, Mr. Speaker, who are transforming and see the opportunity to ensure that Indigenous communities, particularly those most uh, remote and isolated, have access to the kind of infrastructure many people across Ontario have taken for granted. They're interested in consensus and economic opportunity to improve the economic prosperity of the members of their communities and to grow their businesses, Mr. Speaker. That's what Spons. we're going to rally behind all day. I know that the Indigenous leaders support that kind of growth and development, and we're going to continue to work together, Mr. Speaker, with common interests and consensus at the heart and soul. Thank you. The supplementary question. Wake up, Premier. These First Nations are suing your government. The First Nations are here, and they are saying this government is not collaborating. We've seen it time and time again. Ottawa Piscat, extension to full reserve. Community cannot even expand because they're landlocked. Think about this on their traditional territories. Ballwater advisory for 30 years, and it's still happening. Concession and relocation. Not even the road belt, nothing has moved forward, and yet again they're being evacuated. Not to mention the boil water advisories, or the opiate, opiate crisis, the lack of health services, housing, and much more that First Nations are facing. I ask again, will this government respect First Nations' rights and get consent? Minister. Had that question flowed a little more smoothly, Mr. Speaker, uh, it'd be easier to unpack. But, but first of all, let's just talk about the, uh, the relocation of Kasechwan, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we were pleased, obviously, to sign an agreement a, a couple of years ago to move forward on that. Unfortunately, it has faced some delays, and we're hopeful that uh, two communities who, who have a vested interest in that, Kasechwan and moving, and Fort Albany, Mr. Speaker, uh, its neighbour, uh, come to some consensus around how and when that will take place so that we can do the appropriate assessments and move that forward. Uh, uh, but otherwise, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to focus on the economic development projects that we hear from community members and Indigenous business leaders, Mr. Speaker, who want to transform uh, the region, Minister, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that their communities and ensure that their businesses thrive, that young Spons. people have a job in the line of sight, Mr. Speaker. We're going to support the training. We're doing that all across Northern Ontario, and I look forward to the opportunity to work with those communities on specific projects. Thank you. Order. Next question, the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Take a seat. We can't tolerate outbursts from the galleries. That's a true fact. You come, you come to our traditional territory, get our free consent. You're not, not going to bulldoze. Order. Restart the clock. Member for El Elgin Middlesex London had the floor. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thanks to this government's efforts, Ontario is ushering in the next boom of its auto manufacturing sector, which will be a continued catalyst for economic growth and, and development for decades and decades to come. Ontario Auto is back, Speaker, and the latest Volkswagen investment is set to revitalize an entire region. Speaker, in addition to the local benefits, will the minister please tell us what this means for businesses and workers across the entire supply chain? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. 
Volkswagen's $7 billion investment will solidify a brighter future for tens of thousands of auto workers. Over 3,000 direct and 30,000 indirect jobs will be created in total. Major suppliers will be required to produce products that we're unfamiliar with in Ontario. Cathode, anode, separators, copper foil, lithium hydroxide. These are all billion dollar companies that will land in Ontario. We're headed back to Germany to plan a series of supplier days, Speaker, where we're going to match Volkswagen with other Ontario companies. And this will solidify Ontario's position not only as the EV centre, but also as the best place in the world to do business, to invest, to live, and Spons. to grow. Speaker, we are building an EV sector that will continue to create good paying jobs for generations. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his detailed response. Investment like Volkswagen's follow on the government's success in attracting a string of landmark auto manufacturing investments. Much like Volkswagen uh, will tra transform Elgin County, St. Thomas, and London for years and years to come. Ford, Honda, GM, Nexstar, Umicore, Stellantis, and Magna will do very much the same. Speaker, will the minister explain why in the last two and a half years we have been able to see these transformative investments pouring into our province, culminating into the Volkswagen investment? Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, since taking office in 2018, we have reduced the cost of doing business in Ontario by $8 billion annually. With our 2019 Driving Prosperity Plan, we committed to building the cars of the future here. Our plan outlined an entire EV value chain from critical minerals in the north to the manufacturing might in the south, a future where we produce clean steel, batteries, parts, connected and autonomous engineering, cars of the future, and recycling of the finished batteries. That was our plan, and that future speaker is now. $25 billion in auto investments in just two and a half years, Speaker. That's the story of Ontario, and that story will continue with Spons. Ontario as the global leader in the EV supply chain. Thank you. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This Premier and Minister of Infrastructure are painting the Ontario Science Centre as a teardown, but, Speaker, it isn't. They've seen record attendance, and I encourage folks and families to visit them and explore and enjoy their brilliant exhibits. What is true, Speaker, is that capital repairs and building renewal are years behind, and fun fact, according to the Ontario Science Centre's 2022-2023 business plan, Infrastructure Ontario is technically the Science Centre's landlord. The minister says the Science Centre is falling apart, however, the business plans say nothing of the sort. What the Ontario Science Centre needs is for the government to cough up the needed funds and make the repairs. So my question to this minister is, will she keep withholding the funding needed or pay up? Order. And to reply, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sports. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for my mild support around me and the table here. Um, it, it's a great question, and I appreciate it because I also know you understand that the tourism piece, when we're talking about Ontario Place and specifically the Science Centre, but a broader picture of what's going to happen. Um, a good analogy may be an old car that still runs and does awfully well. Gas mileage is not great, but after a while, you have to find a new one. You've had great memories. It can still work, but you have an opportunity to get a newer model, something special, something that is more efficient, something that will carry more people. And when we talk about the movement of the Science Order. Center, we talk about an opportunity, and I paraphrase the, our Premier, a world-class destination. We're talking about tourism. We want people to come into Ontario, because as they're coming in, they stop and buy gas, they buy lunch, they'll spend longer and greater periods of time in the city around what's going to be built, because it will be World class, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, and again, hopefully to the Premier. 
According to the Science Centre's 2019-2020 business plan, the 10-year deferred maintenance costs were $147.5 million. $147.5 million is real money, but it is far less than the cost of the Premier's proposed parking garage at Ontario Place. The minister no doubt realizes that being a better landlord and doing the necessary repairs would be far less costly than building a whole new science centre. So unless the minister is planning to shrink the science centre, the minister knows she can't rebuild a new one for less than the cost of repairs and knows that there isn't money in the budget for this. So my question is, what is the Premier's actual plan for the Ontario Science Centre and what is it going to cost Ontario? To apply, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, we're going to revitalize Ontario Place. We're going to have a world-class destination. We're going to have a science centre, state-of-the-art, worldwide. You know, the, the students up there, they've never experienced Ontario Place because the Liberals and the NDP, you closed it for, what, 12 years now? There's weeds growing up. It's decrepit. We're going to build a great Live Nation amphitheatre. We're going to make sure that Science Centre is there, world-class, 300,000 square feet with exhibits. We're going to make sure that Thermae, wouldn't you love to go to a water park at, at uh, Ontario Place, have fun? There's going to be public space, there's going to be green space all throughout there. Or We're a government that gets it done. You guys talk, we make it happen. That's the difference. Talk. I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Order. 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 We have a member who is anxiously awaiting the opportunity to ask a question. Order. Start the clock. The member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> My question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. The previous Liberal government drove jobs out of our province and failed to unlock Ontario's full economic potential. The negative results of their destructive economic policies left many behind, including those particularly in rural, remote and Indigenous communities across Northern Ontario. In contrast, our government must be focused on solutions so that Ontarians have an opportunity to participate in our growing economy. Many Indigenous businesses are already operating across the North, and there are many more opportunities to create and expand businesses. It's vital that our government continues to work with the Indigenous partners to make targeted investments that will help Indigenous entrepreneurs and businesses to thrive. Speaker, can the Minister please explain what actions our government is taking to increase the economic prosperity Question. in partnerships with Indigenous communities. To Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've already cited a few examples of some economic development uh, corporations acting on behalf of the collective interests of uh, partner First Nations, Mr. Speaker, but it's in fact not limited to Northern Ontario. My colleague, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation, and trade uh, last week with, uh, with the Premier and the Prime Minister of Canada highlighted a world-scale, world-class announcement that's going to involve, Mr. Speaker, the participation of uh, a Treaty Council in that corridor, Mr. Speaker, that's excited about the opportunity to participate, whether it's developing energy infrastructure or corridor infrastructure in general, Mr. Speaker, other businesses that uh, uh, in this supply chain, Mr. Speaker. My colleague, the Minister of, of Energy, and I had participated in a, an exercise with the Six Nation of the Grand River Development Corporation. Response? On storage. These are all examples of large-scale infrastructure projects that go to the heart and soul of Ontario's capacity for economic development, Mr. Speaker, and they're partly or wholly owned by Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And through you, thank you to the Minister for his response. It demonstrates just a few examples of our government's commitment to reconciliation and creating opportunities to strengthen relationships with Indigenous partners. Businesses are only one part of a vibrant economy, though. There are many other ways to amplify prosperity and build a stronger Ontario. Individuals, families, businesses and communities can all succeed when they have the tools, training and supports they need. Investments that help build capacity will go a long way in promoting long-term economic growth. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting growth and prosperity for Indigenous communities? 
Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under the leadership of our Premier, we sat down with the Chiefs of Ontario, uh, Regional Chief Glenn Hare and his economic development team, Mr. Speaker, and we accepted at face value their amazing proposal to do supply chain mapping, Mr. Speaker, to provide loan and grant combinations for Indigenous owned and operated businesses to move forward on a host of exciting proposals that cover. Uh, the province of Ontario. Last week, coming closer to home out in Kenora Rainy River, the uh, Niwin Winda Numic uh, Corporation, Mr. Speaker, largely responsible for most of the work that's going on to twin the, high, the Trans Canada Highway, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, had the full support of this government as we move forward on training 50 more young people, Mr. Speaker, to build our highways. The same opportunity exists into the corridor to prosperity, Mr. Speaker. An opportunity in the central part of Northern Ontario to ensure that they have road access to better programming and services, good jobs, good paying jobs for Indigenous young people, Mr. Speaker. Response. That's what we hear on the ground, and that's what we're responding to in consensus and full partnership with Indigenous business leaders and political leaders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. My best friend lives in Minden, Ontario. In February, he was in a head-on collision, and the worst injuries were suffered by his wife. She had many broken bones and whiplash. My friend, his wife, and his mother were all rushed to the uh, Minden emergency room in separate ambulances, and they said that the first responders and the hospital staff were fantastic. But last week, they found out that this government is closing Minden's emergency room on June 1st. Halliburton, the next nearest hospital, would have been 45 minutes away. Will this government stop the closure of the Minden ER so that the people of Minden have access to life-saving emergency services? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. I'm glad that the member opposite's best friend and his family members had excellent service. It is a story, frankly, that I hear regularly when people have to access, access health care services in the province of Ontario. Ontario Health has been, uh, we have been in discussions with them, and I have been assured that the Halliburton Highlands Health Services Board has approached this decision in the best interests of community. This is a decision made by the hospital with the support of the, ho the hospital board. It is independent of uh, any decisions that we make at the ministry level. Thank you. And the supplementary question. I don't know how closing down an emergency room can be in the best interest of a community. Again, to the Premier, the Halliburton Highlands Health Services said that the Minden ER closure was due to a shortage of nursing and medical staff. For the past five years, this government has been fueling the staffing shortage and creating a crisis on Ontario's public health system in order to privatize it. They could address the staffing shortage by repealing Bill 124. They could stop promoting private for profit clinics that are draining health care staff from public hospitals, and they could support public not for profit hospitals like the one in Minden. Will this government admit that the Minden Emergency Room and the people of Minden are victims of its quest to create a crisis and privatize public health care in Ontario? Members, will please take your seats. Minister of Health. Absolutely not. The Halliburton Highlands Health Services budget has actually Order. increased by over 11 per cent since 2018. But I want to remember, I want to remind the member opposite that these are decisions made by a volunteer community member board that live in the community and are looking out for the best interests of those communities. And for the member opposite to suggest that he knows better that the volunteer-based board than the CEO, than the individuals who work in that facility is patently false. I want to remind the member that the, the actual member from Halliburton Court, the Lakes Brock, has been in close contact with the board and the CEO through this entire process and remind the member that this is a local decision that they have made in the best interest to serve Spons? their community in the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, this government announced free tuition at the Ontario Police College. That's great, but what about all the other jobs in the economy where we lack skilled workers? Why isn't there a plan? 
The collapse of Laurentian University warned us about the fragile finances of colleges and universities. Now Guelph is suddenly pausing 16 programs. A student who is expecting to study medical physics in the fall cannot. Medical physics, the people who run the big machines in hospitals. Why isn't there a plan for education? Is there no plan, even in the secret mandate letters? Look at our electricity system. Order. Years lost because this government cut conservation, renewable energy, delayed investing in storage, all while we knew since 2017 that demand was going to increase. Their natural gas plan idea will collide with Order. the federal government's plan to fight climate change with clean electricity incentives and regulations. Why isn't there a real climate plan? To reply, the government house leader. I actually appreciate uh, I appreciate the question from the honourable member because it was literally a calling card for every single failed policy that brought this province to its knees under the previous Liberal government. Every single thing he talked about, exactly. actually, we had to reverse so that we could bring back thousands of jobs. The policies of the previous Liberal government created an energy crisis in the province that cost, a, that cost manufacturers hundreds of millions Order. of dollars that cost homeowners. Order. They had to make the decision between heating and eating. We saw students fleeing the province of Ontario. We saw opportunity fleeing Order. the province of Ontario. They did literally nothing to combat, uh, uh, to combat our I apologize to the government house leader. The member for Ottawa South must come to order. I can't hear the government house leader. The government house leader has the floor. So, Mr. Speaker, I'd, I'd almost... I'd almost like to seek unanimous consent of the entire House so that he could ask that question again so that the people of the province of Ontario can remember why the two elections, they're still only at eight people over there, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Speaker, does this government really plan? Last night, the Norwich Township Council passed motions having the effect of banning progress and pride flags on municipal property and rejecting Pride Month. Is it discrimination? Well, this government has allowed a backlog of two years to accumulate at the Human Rights Tribunal. It waited for a crisis, waited for thousands of small landlords and tenants to be hurt before putting out— Stop the clock. I apologize now to the member for Kingston the Islands, who I can't hear. I would ask the government side to come to order. We start the clock. Member for Kingston the Islands has the floor. It waited for a crisis, waited for thousands of small landlords and tenants to be hurt before putting adequate resources into the landlord and tenant board. Is there a plan for the justice system? The government said it was triple-checking the business case for tearing down and moving the science center. Then it said there was no business case to release. Then it said the site could be used for other purposes. This government is shooting from the hip. With the help of a developer, they have a plan for Ontario Place, but there's no plan for Ontario. Who's in charge? Question. Okay. Government House Leader can reply. I tell you who's in charge, Mr. Speaker. I tell you who's in charge. It's the Premier of the Province of Ontario who's brought back thousands of jobs to the Province of Ontario. That's who's in charge. It was this Premier who finally put the Liberals out of their misery and restored hope and opportunity to the Province of Ontario. You remember, you tried to build transit but couldn't get it done. This Premier in office for a couple of months and built the biggest transit infrastructure program in the history of the country. You also remember you tried to build long-term care. You didn't get it done, but it was this Premier who said we have to end hallway health care. We're going to build 60,000 new and upgraded long-term care beds. You also remember that manufacturers were leaving in droves. It was this Premier, with this Economic Development Minister, who brought back $25 billion worth of investment in the auto sector when you were saying we had to transition to a service economy. It was this Premier who brought back the energy sector. Stop the clock. Order. 
the government side come to order. The member for Ottawa South come to order. I think there's a point that needs to be clarified. For a supplementary question to be valid, it has to have some relationship to the original question, same subject, and follow and flow from the original question and the original response from the government. But the speaker has to be able to hear the member who has, is asking the question to ascertain whether or not it does follow and flow. So I would ask the indulgence of the House to assist me in this regard. And we have a member who is awaiting the opportunity to ask a question. We'll start the clock. The member for Chatham, Kent, Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. The classroom must always be a safe place for students to focus on the necessary life, job, and critical thinking skills that they need to succeed. Students and staff in Ontario schools need to know that when they go to school, they'll be free from physical harm. Students and staff should never be afraid to go to school, and parents must be assured that their children are safe and secure in our schools. In order to do this, our province needs to invest in schools and partner closely with community organizations that will support our young people in their everyday lives. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to protect the safety and well-being of both our students and our staff? Great Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Chatham, Ken Leamington, for his service as an officer and someone who wore the uniform, keeping families safe in this province. And while we stand with the member from Chatham, Ken Leamington, we stand with all law enforcement, ensuring children and communities are safe from the rise of violent crime in this country. Mr. Speaker, we just announced on Monday an additional $23 million investment specifically to combat crime and as well as violence bullying happening within our school system. Part of that is a partnership with the Pinball Clemens Foundation, expanded to many school boards across Ontario, designed specifically to offer counselling, leadership and career development for kids at, at, uh, at risk. We announced a 38 per cent expansion of the Focus on Youth program. 28,000 kids are benefiting. This is an investment across school boards to encourage them to get access to jobs and mentorship development. Mr. Speaker, we've also announced a partnership with Sheldon Kennedy's Respect Group to help countering bullying in Response. schools. And most importantly, anchored by a $100 million investment in mental health, a 500 per cent increase from the former Liberals, this is going to help keep kids safe right across Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's very encouraging that our government is taking decisive measures to promote, to promote safety in our schools. Each generation of students faces their own challenges inside and outside the classroom. Physical and online bullying affect students in every part of our province, and the negative effects of bullying can impact students for a lifetime. Students must be protected and supported beyond their classrooms and school property. Our government must take action to address these serious issues that many children will sadly encounter. Ontario must have a plan to combat this severe issue and keep our students safe. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to ensure the safety of students inside the classroom and beyond it? Minister of Education. Thank you uh, very much to the member for this important question. The first is the zero tolerance approach we took in the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act, where we have, in, led, through legislation, ensured that any educator that is convicted of a crime, a very serious crime with respect to sexual exploitation of a child, receives a lifetime ban. They will never be able to teach in the province of Ontario. We have also required every educator. Uh, to uh, have fulfilled a sexual abuse prevention training this past September. That extended to all teachers and all early childhood educators, the first province to do so. We were the first province to mandate that every school has an anti-sex trafficking plan to counter the rise of trafficking, particularly in the province of the 400 series highways that is so prevalent in our communities. We're the first province to have mandated uh, within the curriculum, learning specific to cyberbullying, to privacy, to healthy relationships and to consent. This is important as we build 
um, a, a young generation of, of kids who Fonts. understand how they themselves be part of the solution of deterring crime. We're all in this together. We are committed to working with everyone in the College of Teachers, the faculties, unions and boards to make sure schools are safe for kids in Ontario. Next question. The member for Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. We heard what happened at Minden Hospital. Now let's go to Carlton Place Hospital, where the local hospital was forced to close its emergency department overnight because there were enough staff to keep it open. A week before, it was its sister hospital that was closed overnight due to staff shortages, its third closure in as many months. Ontario had exactly one one unplanned emergency room closure in the last 15 years. But in the last year alone, we've now had 160. 160 emergency room closure in a single year. This is a normal speaker, and we should not pretend that it is. What new measure will the Premier take today to stop the closure of emergency rooms across our province? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. So one of the really important measures that is embedded in Bill 60 and the Your Health document, I hope the member will seriously consider supporting because it is an as-of-right program that ensures individual clinicians who are practicing in any other Canadian jurisdiction can come to Ontario and immediately start working here in Ontario in communities. You know, that is one very specific example where we have been able to work with the College of Nurses of Ontario to make sure that that uh, people who have trained in other jurisdictions are able to quickly get their uh, qualifications assessed and approved if appropriate. You know, another important initiative, uh, the Minister of Colleges and University has really been a true leader in the Learn and Stay program, where we are able to provide tuition and cover books for students who want Response. to practice as nurses and other critical care health care providers. And we've had a historic number of students apply for those programs because they want to participate. Supplementary. 160 emergency room closure in one year under this minister's watch. Let's go to Chelsea. In Chelsea right now, if a child requires care on a Saturday, they are out of luck. Their local emergency room is now closed evenings and weekends due to staff shortages. People there are worried that this is a sign that the end is near for this hospital. The member of Bruce Gray Owen Sound said that he wants Chelsea Hospital to return to full service, but after 10 years on the job, it does not look good, Speaker. What? Would the Premier agree that the people of Chelsea deserve a full time emergency room? What will the government do to keep the emergency rooms open in our province? Minister Cox. Now, when the member highlights the challenges of making sure that we have sufficient HHR health human resources, she doesn't also acknowledge the uh, important work and the ability to support those changes, whether it is the as of right ensuring individuals who want to come to Ontario can start practicing immediately, whether it is the expansion of the undergraduate and postgraduate positions in post secondary, uh, um, a, uh, an expansion that, frankly, if I could turn back time, we wouldn't have had the Liberals or the NDP when they were in government actually show, tightening up and removing those residency spots and those postgraduate positions. You know, we are making the investments, whether it is in education, whether it is in capital builds, whether it is in ensuring that we have as many people as possible who wish to practice in the province of Ontario have that right and ability to do so. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Health. People across Algoma, Manitoulin are struggling to access health care. My office is often hearing from individuals and families who are having to wait two, three, four, or more years to be matched with a family doctor through Healthcare Connect. The Ontario College of Physicians reported in February that 2.2 million Ontarians are currently without a family doctor. 
Rural and northern communities are especially struggling to ensure residents have access to a physician and primary care. In pre-budget consultations this year, Dr. Stephen Cooper from Manitoulin Island told this government that Northern Ontario is facing a shortfall of 350 family doctors and specialists. Dr. Cooper said in his submission, it is hard to overstate the consequences for access to care if this trend continues. Question. Speaker, what is this government's plan to stop, growing, to stop the growing shortage of health care professionals in the North? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. The member opposite raises a very important question, and I was so pleased earlier this year through the investments of the Ministry of Finance to be able to announce the Blind River Huron Shores Family Health Team in Northeast of an additional $1.1 billion. Million. My, my apologies. And this will ensure that they have the ability to hire two new for full-time nurse practitioners, two service workers, two new registered nurses, one RPN, one full-time physiotherapist, a system navigator, all that will support over 5,000 orphan unattached patients along the North Shore corridor. These are the investments that our government is making to ensure that communities across Ontario have access to the health care close to home. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary, back to the member for Algoma Manitoulin. Health. In order to recruit and retain doctors in rural and northern communities, this government needs to ensure that a full continuum of care continues and exists across the north. Dr. Chantelle Wilson from Manitoulin Island reached out to my office recently about the struggles she is facing practicing in small communities on western Manitoulin. She said, My area has not had access to a home care nurse for two weeks. Dressing changes, etc., are coming to my office, adding to my already overflowing plate. I feel that providing care to Western Manitoulin, including 45 inpatients at the local nursing home, will not be sustainable in the not so distant future. Speaker, physicians are trying their best to service their communities, but without help from this government, they are burning out and are being left no choice but to close their practices. Will this minister and this government immediately Question. introduce measures to recruit and retain health care professionals in Northern Ontario before more physicians are forced to leave? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. The, you know, something that would be of particular interest to this member is an investment that the Minister of Colleges and Universities and, and Health has made at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. We will, in fact, have an additional 14 undergraduate positions and 22 postgraduate positions. You know, those are some of the con concrete examples of how we are ensuring that people have community and access. And the other, of course, is the as of rights, so that individuals who wish to uh, practice and live in a beautiful part of Ontario have that ability if they are currently in another Canadian jurisdiction. They can come immediately with a job offer and start working without having to wait for those long uh, licensure pieces. It's important work, and it's work that we're very proud to be able to do as we continue to expand Bonds. and shore up our health human resources. Next question. The member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. People in my, in my riding and in the province are very concerned about the safety and welfare of animals. Through media reports, we hear about situations of neglect, cruelty, such as inhumane conditions where animals are kept in cramped enclosures and animals are in distress because they don't have the basics like food and water. Other circumstances where animals can be abused include the mistreatment of wildlife and animals that are used for entertainment purposes. Abuse, neglect, and cruelty of any animal cannot be tolerated. The people of our province expect our government to ensure that Ontario animals are protected and treated in a humane manner. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain how our government is keeping animals safe in our province? Good question, Brian. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my great friend, our colleague from Cambridge. 
Many of us here in this chamber and in the galleries have pets that are part of our families, and in our family we have Hal the Rabbit, who's 10. After years of neglect from the previous government, we passed, our government passed the Provincial Animal Welfare Service Act, or the PAWS Act. I want to give a special shout out to our great member from Etobicoke Lakeshore, who was a great champion and advocate for this. A first of its kind, the PAWS Act has established a robust, transparent and accountable organization, staffed by over 100 qualified and passionate inspectors. Our animal welfare legislation has one of the most severe punishments in the country. But, Mr. Speaker, over the years, our inspectors have rescued thousands of animals, have levied oh. thousands of orders and charges against abusers, because people in Ontario care. With your help, we will always make Ontario a better place for our pet. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is reassuring and encouraging to hear about additional powers that have come from provincial animal welfare legislation that will ensure that animals and wildlife are protected. Yeah. However, the residents of Cambridge, like many other across the province, are interested in what additional measures our government will undertake to provide even greater protection for animals. It is important that our government continues to evaluate the effectiveness of current legislation and take action to strengthen laws that will increase compliance and enforcement. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please elaborate on how our government is ensuring animal welfare protection is enforced? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, I thank the member from Cambridge for this important question. Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy to share good news that in our Strengthening Safety and Modernization Justice Act that I just introduced yesterday, our legislation is moving forward in proposing amendments to the Protecting Animal Welfare Services Act that will address additional compliances and enforcement. We've consulted with the Colleges of Veterinarians of Ontario and other experts in the field to make sure that we provide strong protection for our animals. And this includes enhancing inspector powers and permitting them to immediately remove an animal if it is in critical condition or distress. And we're continuing to strengthen compliance and enforcement. We will always keep our animals safe. Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Residents yesterday were shocked to learn that Ottawa is receiving only $845,100 of the $200 million Ontario is giving municipalities to tackle the homelessness crisis. Ontario's second largest city, home to a million people, facing one of the biggest homelessness crises it has ever faced, is receiving only enough money to build two affordable homes. Curiously, at the same time, the minister's own riding received triple what Ottawa got with less than a fifth of the population. Something seems off. Minister, can you provide a full account of where your government's affordable housing funding is going and why? Out of touch. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I'd be happy to, Speaker. Um, you know, it's interesting that this member asked the question when the person who sits beside her when he was a regional councillor, asked the same thing that the Auditor General asked, and that was to fix the Order. broken formula from the previous government Order. in a 2021 value for money audit, and you can read it right here, it talks about the inequity of that program. We had Mayor Sutcliffe and officials from Ottawa here. We explained the situation to them. But we are responding directly to the 2021 Auditor General's report where it said for funding equity. So you know who you need to ask, member? You need to ask the people from Niagara, the people Order. from London, the people from Windsor who were shortchanged on that previous formula. Ask your colleague. Remind the members they can't use props to illustrate their points. Supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, back, to, back to the minister. The uh, minister should read the Auditor General's report because in that report, the Auditor General said this government has no Order. plan to end homelessness. Every city and every
every town in Ontario is facing a housing affordability crisis and a homelessness crisis, Order. which is why it is shocking this government is cutting funding to affordable housing, and it is why it is shocking this government is banning municipalities from using and collecting development fees for affordable housing projects. Minister, can your government commit to providing cities with the fair funding they are asking for to build the affordable housing they need. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, you notice how she wiggled away from the Auditor General's report and the, and the City of uh, Ottawa. I'm going to go back to it. So the updated formula was developed based on the feedback from the Auditor General and municipal stakeholders. The updated model takes into consideration a community's share of homelessness, supportive housing unit, low-income households, households in deep core housing need, as defined by CMHC, and Indigenous and youth populations. We are not Order. going to facilitate a funding formula that was outlined in the Auditor General's report that forgets about communities like those in Niagara, like those in London, like those in Windsor. You know, we're not going Order. to do that. We're going to respond to the Auditor General's Order. report and have a fair funding formula that treats all of Ontario with fairness and Response. equity. Order. The next question. The member for Cambridge. I was never reading it down. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. The agri-food sector contributes over $47 billion to Ontario's GDP, an amazing number. That is in part because of the thousands of agri-food businesses across the province and in my riding that produce high-quality products made right here in Ontario. Businesses like Farm to Table Canada, Grand River Foods bring world-renowned products to market, meeting the demands of a growing population in an international market. Can the minister explain how our government will continue to expand opportunities for the agri-food businesses in my riding? Mr. Mayor, Culture, Food and Rural Affairs. Very much, and I do appreciate the question from the member from Cambridge, because, Speaker, our government has set out ambitious growth targets for our agri-food sector through our Grow Ontario strategy, and in that strategy, we have committed to growing Ontario's agri-food markets and exports by 8% annually by 2020 or 2030. Excuse me. And I'm pleased to say, Speaker, that we have already taken steps to accomplish just that. Last week, we announced our Grow Ontario Market Initiative, and while I was at the Earlton Farm Show, I want to share with you as well that an astute person said, "If you don't have the sale." Nothing else matters, and you need good marketing initiatives to secure that sale. And that's what we're doing, Speaker. We're introducing a $6 million Grow Ontario Marketing Initiative Program through the Sustainable Canadian Agricultural Partnership. Response? And the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for your response. That is great news for the agri-food sector, and according to the OMAFRA, data. That is great news for over 600 agri-food businesses in my riding, and we're continuing to build a strong Ontario economy. As we've seen over the last few years, accessing excuse me, new markets is essential for a business to prosper and grow. Can the minister explain how Grow Ontario Market Initiative will help agri-food businesses reach these new markets? Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Speaker, the potential for growth in Ontario's agri-food sector is absolutely tremendous. And our government, through the leadership of Premier Ford and our entire caucus, we are showing our commitment to making sure businesses have the supports that they need. Uh, because we want them to be even more competitive, not only domestically here in Canada, but around the world. And through the Grow Ontario Marketing Initiative, eligible businesses can receive up to 50 percent cost share for their eligible costs in terms of ramping up their marketing initiatives, and that translates into up to $60,000 in funding. And we're also putting out supports for our in industry organizations as well. And if they have eligible projects, they could receive up to $125,000. Speaker, we're Response. committed to building Ontario, and it's through Ontario's agri-food sector and the building of our marketing initiatives that we are going to absolutely prevail and show the rest of the world. Thank you very much. 
The next question, the member for Ottawa West Media. Merci, Président. Thank you, Speaker. Teachers shortage, shortage in the francophone education system is endangering the quality of French education in the province, but this the government is not doing much to solve this issue. Kids are anxious, parents as well, and some schools will have to close close their doors because they don't they can't find teachers. Some francophone children have had nine teachers in one single academic year. And sometimes they get to they get to school on one day to find out that they have a different teacher from the day before. It's not fair. The Minister of Education have talked about a, um, a program to act. Could the minister act and act now, please? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for this question. I'm very pleased to confirm that French language education funding in Ontario is at the highest levels in Ontario history. In addition to that, we introduced legislation in the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act that is specific to responding to the need to certify French educators quicker. I hope the members opposite will put ideology aside and vote for quicker no, processing won't. times of new French teachers. In addition, in that very bill, we allow French educators, based on what's called a experience certificate, to allow more individuals mid-career with professional competence working with kids in French language to work within our schools, a request of school boards to help ensure we attract more. We announce a joint French education a recruitment program with education unions, with federations and school boards and the French community itself to recruit French educators. We now have $13 million more million to do it. I am proud that we've recruited more French language educators as a result of that with a commitment to do much, much more for French schools in Ontario. That concludes the time we have for question period today. Point of order, the member for Algoma Manitoba.